Today we're wrapping up our series on the Trinity, which means you all should probably know where we're going just based on theology, right? Uh, Where we're headed with today's message. Uh, Everyone's job is no one's job. You've heard that phrase before, right? Everyone's job is no one's job. If you've ever been in the midst of a meeting where people sat around and they discussed what we need to do, right? And then everyone left that meeting with a sense that we need to do something, but no one ever got designated to do that something. That something ain't getting done. If you recall being forced into group work as a teenager in high school or maybe in college, you'll know this agonizing pattern all too well. Without one person stepping up to the front and suggesting what needs to happen, the whole project dies the death of deferment. Everybody goes, well, I think we ought to, but if you guys would rather, or it seems to me, and I'm not trying to be bossy, but like, it seems to me that maybe we should. Most jobs come with a job description. Amen. And it's a good thing. That's the case. Here's what you're expected to do. A job description without such clarity. How could you know whether or not you were performing well in your job? Indeed, most jobs require not just that you know your job description, but that you also know what the people around you are supposed to be up to. Why? Well, this helps us demarcate our responsibilities from their responsibilities. Not just for the purposes of blame, but for knowing exactly what you're supposed to be doing and where your job intersects with other jobs and how we might best work together and make all of these things happen as they ought to happen. I need to know what a coworker is about, therefore I know how better to rely on said coworker. As we discussed the Trinity during this past month, have you figured out the job descriptions yet? Do you know what each member of the Trinity, each member of the Godhead is about? What are their unique roles? Well, so far we've talked about the Father and the Father is the source. He is the structure and the divine will that is active on earth and throughout cosmic history. God's job is succinctly described in Psalm 115, verse 3. Here's what it says. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. If anyone ever asks you what God is up to, feel free to cite that scripture passage. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. So God is the primary. He is the source, and it is his will that is being done. But what of the Son? Well, have you noted that the Son is the mediator and the means? He is the bridge that gets us into the presence of God. He is the means by which God does his work. The Father creates and sustains through who? Through Jesus, through the Son. According to John 1, God judges the earth through whom? Through Jesus, according to John chapter 5. The Son does the will of the Father. It is through Jesus that atonement or payment is made for our sins and through whom which, uh, through whom mediation takes place between us and God. The Son is the way. Nobody comes into relationship to, with the Father except through the Son. But what does the Holy Spirit do? What is the Holy Spirit all about? His description... And his job description are the objective of our study this week. And this is a big pill to swallow. There's a whole lot that is here. We're going to pack a whole lot into this message, a whole lot of scripture passages once again. And we're going to finish addressing our series on the Trinity by talking about the nature and function of the Holy Spirit. Because it's such a big thing, let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Lord, our God. We come before you as uh, people who um, know the smallness of our minds and recognize that there, there's so much that we do not understand about you. God, I, I pray that we have been going to you constantly during the course of this past month and asking that, that question of you, um, asking of our heart's desire that we might know you more. Lord, today we ask that again. Lord, we want to understand the Holy Spirit. We want to see the role of the Holy Spirit, not just in cosmic history, but in our lives. And so would you help to seal these ideas and this understanding from your word into our hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, we ask you to make this come about. We ask in the name of the Son. We ask you, Father. Amen. 
We'll start today by talking about the nature of the Holy Spirit. Secondarily then, we're going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit. And if you're feeling panicky because point two seems to be stretching a long time, don't worry, point three is very short. Point three is just a conclusion. We're going to wrap up this series on the Trinity and some particulars about the Holy Spirit, but it'll be fast. Let's first talk about the nature of the Holy Spirit. Are there any middle children in the audience? Come on, raise your hands high and proud. Nobody will see you otherwise. (laughs) I'm a middle kid. uh, And we, we middle kids are prone to sort of disappear in the shuffle, aren't we? Aren't we? <laughs> yeah. We're easily overlooked. We're easily underestimated. And, and as I was thinking about our study for this week, I, was, I came across a word that I have never heard used before. The word is pneumatology. Now, I have been in theology for, uh, professionally for more than 20 years. And this is the first time I've come across this word. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. And I thought to myself, how can I have been in ministry for this long and have studied theology for as long as I have and only be running across the word pneumatology right now? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's that the Holy Spirit is often somewhat disregarded in terms of theological study. It, I'm not, not unlike a middle child, the Holy Spirit uh, sort of disappears in the more tangible and evident work of the Father and the Son, the other two members of the Godhead. More than a few theologians have actually described the Holy Spirit as the forgotten person of the Trinity. And I find that it's often the case. In fact, in the Apostles' Creed, which Rachel and the band were doing right at the front of the service, they were doing Rich Mullins' version of that that Apostles' Creed. But in the Apostles' Creed, you have God the Father, and then we, we give you a whole bunch of definitional features of the nature of God and the Father. And then we talk about Jesus the Son, and we talk about a whole lot of things that happen in his life. But did you notice what it does when it gets to the Holy Spirit? It says, we believe in the Holy Spirit. (laughs) <laughs> well, what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? Like, what's there? Now, this is an ancient creed, and I'm not, I'm not dissing the creed. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. But what I'm saying is, this is the way it often works with the Spirit. We, we sometimes render him sort of a backseat position in terms of what God does or how God is functioning. Let's first talk about who the Holy Spirit is as we get started today. First of all, we need to know that the Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is personal. What is the Holy Spirit? Personal. Now, you might not think this is a big deal, but this is actually a big deal. There are a lot of pseudo-Christian cults that hold that the Holy Spirit is not personal, that rather the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force. For instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses who occasionally show up at your door. If you talk to them, if you invite them in and you sit down and talk to them, you'll find that their version of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force. And so if you were to bring up to them and say, well, what about all the times that the Holy Spirit is made to be incredibly personal in the text? They would say, well, that's mere personification. It's like what you see in uh, in Proverbs chapter 8, where Lady Wisdom is personified. You know, we're not actually teaching that wisdom is a woman, right? And that somewhere she's out there. It's a personification. And that's what they would tell you. The two issues that are used to establish the idea that God is impersonal are as follows. Number one, a neuter tense is used to discuss the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is not described typically as he or she, but rather as a neuter entity, right? Without gendered. Um, The second thing is that the Holy Spirit is often spoken of merely as power or empowerment, or oftentimes power is tied to the Holy Spirit such that people look at it and they're like, well, the Holy Spirit must be like electricity, or like gravity, right? It's empowerment. It's, it's, it's God's power at work. And sometimes people will try to express it that way. Theologian James White was speaking about Jehovah's Witnesses, and he said, we need to think about how their theology actually plays out when you try to make their theology attached to the actual Scripture. For instance, he says, when you see that we are told in the Great Commission to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how must a Jehovah's Witness render that? Well, it's this way. Baptize in the name of Jehovah, Michael the Archangel, and an impersonal force. That renders a little weird, doesn't it? 
To decide this matter, to understand whether or not the Holy Spirit is personal versus impersonal, we've got to ask a very important question. What is a person? What makes a person a person? And so let's describe that for just a moment. There are many defining characteristics that we ascribe to persons, or we say sets an individual apart as a person. Personhood is at least in part defined as the ability to distinguish between yourself and others. So we have to ask, is this entity self-aware? Is this entity capable of cognition? A person is also defined as being capable of relating to other independent beings. So the question of personhood, if we're going to break it down, looks a little bit like this. And I want you to think about this in terms of what you've read about the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Does the Holy Spirit distinguish self from other beings or even members of the Godhead? Yes, absolutely that's the case. The Son has to go to the Father so that the Father can send whom? The Spirit. Remember when Jesus is being baptized, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and is over the head of of Jesus. He comes upon Jesus, and then we hear a voice from heaven of the Father. So there is definite distinction between the two. A second question of personhood. Is the Holy Spirit capable of cognition and independent thinking? Yes. He, He has to be, because the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Can you grieve gravity? Or centrifugal force? You know, what, what, how do you grieve something that is a force? The Holy Spirit can be provoked. Those are personal experiences and personal interactions. Is the Holy Spirit re- able to relate to other beings? These are easy answers. <laughs> yes, certainly. For instance, it is the Holy Spirit who chooses Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13. He chooses them for missions to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit must be obeyed according to Acts chapter 10. The Holy Spirit can be lied to according to Acts chapter 5 and can be resisted according to Acts chapter 7. The Holy Spirit can also be outraged according to Hebrews chapter 10. Does that sound like a person? Yes. So using this standard of measure of person, the Holy Spirit appears in every way, in every respect, to be a personal agency. There's more than this. I was listening to a uh, a Russian preacher this past week, and he was discussing this issue. He said, pay attention. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit searches all things. The Holy Spirit reveals. The Holy Spirit teaches. He intercedes. He calls and places man in service. He leads. He creates. He sanctifies. The Holy Spirit helps. He gives gifts. He works miracles. He bears witness. He regenerates. He guides us into truth. He glorifies Christ. He has fellowship and communion, and he speaks to the churches. Does that sound like a personal agency? Amen, it does. Regarding the objection that the neuter tense is often used with discussion of the Holy Spirit, this is not a compelling argument against personhood. And we can see this even in our own languages. For instance, in German, which is a highly gendered language, the term for little girl is das Mädchen, which is neuter. Now, would we, would we assume that the Germans therefore think that little girls are not entities or they're not people or that they're merely objects or forces? No, of course not. It's just a linguistic feature. And when you're describing the spirit, the wind, the breath of God, you do so in the neuter term. It's not meaning that that is not a person behind that. In fact, as we'll see in a little while, uh, Greek grammar is actually violated in the scriptural text in order to assign he, the term he, to the Holy Spirit, which you would never do in Greek unless you were making a point that this is a person. Okay, so why does this matter, you might be thinking. Ben, we don't care. Is the Holy Spirit a person or not? Is the Holy Spirit a force? That really doesn't matter, does it? It really does. You know why? You can't form a relationship with a force. It doesn't work. Can you get engaged to gravity? Can can you invite centrifugal force over to the house to have dinner with the family? No, you cannot. Imagine approaching another person in your life as if they were just sort of an uh, an elemental power, right? Or, or just disregarding them as something to be used or a feature of this existence that was in no way personal. Do you think that would impact the relationship? Try an experiment with your wife or husband this week. 
See, see what happened? Don't. Don't do that. We've got enough counseling as it is. Um, the Holy Spirit must be seen as he is described in the pages of Scripture if we hope to have right relationship with him. And so to that end, it is very important that first we recognize the Holy Spirit is personal. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is divine. And we spoke about this in our first part of this series, but I want to focus in a little bit more on a few texts today as we talk about the divine nature of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Scripture identifies the Holy Spirit as God explicitly. Acts chapter 5, which was a passage we referenced in our first week on this series, is the discussion of Ananias and Sapphira, early church experience. Listen to Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Who did Ananias lie to? The Holy Spirit. Okay, let's keep reading. And to keep back some of the uh, price of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the Holy Spirit is God. Okay, very clear right there in the text. The Holy Spirit is identified as God, but more than that, the Holy Spirit is the one who's to, or against whom the greatest blasphemy can be committed. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Therefore I say to you, and this is Jesus speaking, he's just been accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, by the power of Satan, okay? And he's responding to these teachers who have just charged that this miraculous work that they just witnessed of God, that that was brought about by the work of Satan. And this is Jesus' response to them. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Is this serious? Jesus is saying, you could blaspheme me, you could come against me, you could ridicule me and hammer me, and that can be forgiven, but you can't do that against the Holy Spirit. And if you're like most people in this room right now, and you're like, have I committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Relax, if you're concerned about it, you almost certainly have not. So Jesus says this type of blasphemy, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the most severe blasphemy that can be committed. Now, understanding that that's the case, to whom can we commit, or whom against can we commit blasphemy? It's only against God. So is the Holy Spirit divine? Yes, absolutely. The Holy Spirit is identified as God. The Holy Spirit is the subject of the most severe blasphemy that human beings can create or uh, commit. Um, and the Holy Spirit is named in baptism. Finding your name in a list tells you a lot about yourself, depending on the list, Right? If someone were like Adolf Hitler and Ceausescu and Stalin and Jim, right? You don't want to be Jim in that, in that narrative, right? Because the, the list tells you a lot about who you are or about who people think you are. Well, we have the Holy Spirit named in the context of baptism. Matthew 29, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the and the Holy Spirit, okay? If the Holy Spirit is an impersonal agency, it makes no sense to be named in the context of, of uh, baptism. Moreover, if the Holy Spirit is not divine, if the Holy Spirit is just some agent sent or bestowed by God, it is not something that you would expect to be named as part of the salvation process. What did I just do? This is what happens when you print on front and back. All right, I'm using more paper. Hang on, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, we're going to get there. Here we are. Okay, now I know where we are. This little interruption brought to you by your <laughs> minister's inadequacy. All right, the, the Holy Spirit is identified as God. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. The Holy Spirit is present in the context of baptism and named in baptism. But more than that, if you, if you think, okay, well, the Holy Spirit is God, then shouldn't we see evidence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad I asked myself that question because 
We definitely do see evidence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Remember uh, the second verse in your Bible? The second sentence in your Bible? And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters? There's the Holy Spirit right at the front. But where else is the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Well, actually, right at the instigation of Abraham and Sarah. Remember, before they were Abraham and Sarah, they were Abram and Sarai, called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Well, what's the difference here? Let's do a quick experiment. Hold your hand in front of your mouth like this and say, Abram. Now say, Abraham. Did you feel a difference? Try it again. Sarai. Sarah. When God changed their name, what did he add? A breath. Right in the midst, when when he's starting his people, when he says, you're my people, I've called out, he added a breath to their names. The Spirit placed in in the very origin of the Jewish people. Why will you be different? Because my Spirit will be upon you and in your very name. More than this, though, as the prophets speak, where are the prophets getting their word from? The scripture tells us it is the Spirit of God speaking through the mouths of prophets to bring forth the Word of God. Some priests had the Holy Spirit. Some kings had the Holy Spirit. But they didn't have it in the same way that you and I have it. They had a very different form of the Holy Spirit. Something different occurred in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is present in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is divine The Holy Spirit is personal agency. And here's something you need to know. The Holy Spirit is unique in world religions. Now, many religions have a belief in one God. Isn't that true? There are the major monotheisms, and then there are a slew of like much lesser religious faiths that have some belief that there must be a God of some sort. And here's something really weird. Almost every religion tries to co-op Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Every religious, now this is weird. Like in the stage of world religions, this is bizarre. Have you ever heard a Christian going, Muhammad was really one of us when you think about it? Or, you know, the Buddha was really just uh, trying to get to Christianity. You've never done that, right? However, when it comes to Jesus of Nazareth, the Muslims hold that Jesus was a prophet and not just any prophet. He was spoken into existence by God. And not only that, but he's the only entity in history who was sinless. And so they say, he's one of ours. He's one of ours. The Jews, when they look at Jesus, say, well, he was, no, really what he was, was he was a, he was a Pharisee. And people just really misunderstood his teachings. That was really what was going on there. A lot of Buddhists will look at Jesus and they're like, well, he was a bodhisattva. He was one who was like aspiring to be a Buddha. And people have just misunderstood what he's doing. And then you take every smattering of cult that's out there. If you have somebody who believes that God intended us to use psychedelics at all times, they'll be like, well, Jesus was really using psychedelics, right? Because they try to integrate it into their system. Why? Because he is impossible to ignore in the cosmic stage. You've got to do something with him. And so many people will try to even co-opt Jesus into their systems. But what about the Holy Spirit? Well, some world religions will describe God as, as you. You are God. Pantheism, for instance, will say, you're God. You're God. You're God. We're all God together. The, whatever the dog left out in the yard, that's God. Uh, and whatever you ate today, that's God. And everything is God. Right? That's what pantheists say. But that's not what we're saying, is it? When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about God, a separate personal agency, an entity that resides in us. It's something entirely different. Judaism speaks about the Spirit moving in prophets or the Spirit speaking to prophets, but it would have been wrong, mindfully, for the Jewish person to say, that Spirit abides in me. That Spirit dwells in me. That Spirit lives in me. And they wouldn't say that. Christianity is the only faith in the world that says that God is taking up an active and perpetual residence in individual human beings. You are a house for the God of this universe. So what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is unique in world religions. The Holy Spirit is a personal agency, and the Holy Spirit is divine. Now let's get to the job description portion. What is the Holy Spirit up to? What is the Holy Spirit about? A host of videos have emerged in recent years filming kids trying to figure out how to use old technology. It's pretty funny. 
So they'll set like, you know, rotary phones in front of kids and they'll be like, what is this? And the kids will try to figure it out and look at it. It'll take record players and have kids try to use them or floppy disks or operating a tape recorder or fixing an audio tape, something that was uh, par for the course for everybody, you know, who was raised during the 1980s, maybe using a 35 millimeter camera and trying to figure out how to do it. And it's funny to watch because something that many of us are very familiar with has become an enigma, an absolute mystery to people who are younger than us and not raised with the experience of that technology. In similar fashion, the work of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is and does, is quite familiar to many people in this room. But if you're new to the faith, or if you've never really invested yourself by reading the instruction manual, your scriptures, you might not have an adequate view of what the Holy Spirit is supposed to be about. So let's spend some time talking about that. The Holy Spirit is, first of all, a conduit. A conduit. You guys know what a conduit is, right? A conduit is the means by which transmission takes place. The means by which transmission takes place. The Holy Spirit is our enduring connection to the Father and the Son. Now, the three persons of the Godhead are one essence. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yeah, okay, all right. Just making sure we didn't waste our time this past month. Uh, With that in mind, I want you to listen to the following passage, and I want you to imagine trying to diagram what's happening here. Right? Listen to this. Romans 8, verses 9 and 10. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But uh, But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, through the bo- or though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You want to try to diagram that one? Who's doing what in that text? The spirit of God is described and described interchangeably with the spirit of Christ. And also, it's not just the Spirit of God who dwells in you, but did you notice who is dwelling in you? Christ dwells in you. The Father, through the Spirit, has raised Jesus, and the Father gives us life, present tense, through His Spirit. Whoa, that's confusing. It's it's almost like the Holy Spirit is actively blurring the lines between the persons of the Trinity and ourselves. Almost as if the Holy Spirit is the means by which the Father and Son are mingling and working with us like a conduit. The Holy Spirit is our means of accessing the Father and the Son at all times. The Holy Spirit is the means by which the Son works through us and does His work in us. More than that, though, the Holy Spirit is, uh, is also all about translation. As I get older, and because I've been married for so long, I find it very amusing to watch young men stick their feet in their mouths when trying to communicate with women. If you're, if you're a guy who's been married for a while, we all took our lumps learning how to do this, right? But long experience in marriage tends to teach you a lot about what's good to do and say and what's not good to do and say. And nobody ever gives you a guidebook to help you sort of navigate that rule set. And so it is the doom for most young men to flounder around quizzically wondering why they just offended that girl so much. Many of us probably would have loved to have had an intercessor editing our interactions. Oh, what he meant to say was, right? just someone to qualify what we were trying to do or say, teaching us maybe how to better render our thoughts. If only there were someone to correct our cluelessness before it bursts into offense and open hostility. (laughs) Have you ever thought about how offensive and blasphemous most of the things we try to say to God are? How often we inject our own opinions as if God should be taking our advice? Think about what that feels like to be the God who created the cosmos and having a human being try to tell you what to do or what is best. How often we ask for things that are spiritually dangerous to us. How often we fail to recognize God's power and willingness to help us until a crisis has the whole building burning down around our heads. If only we had a translator 
If only there were someone to intervene, to say to us and speak to us and train us on how we're supposed to interact with the God of this cosmos. We do. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray. We do not know how to pray as we should, but the the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Notice what's happening here. It starts with our inability to communicate rightly with God, to express ourselves to the God of this universe. And the Holy Spirit is functioning as sort of a filter and redirection and editor to step in and make what we say to God holy and tell us what God is saying in return. He is our translator. If you've ever had a kid with a speech impediment, you probably, you probably know some of what this is like, right? You got a kid who talks like they got a mouthful of mashed potatoes at all times, right? And everybody else is like, what'd they say? What'd they say? And you're standing, and you're the only person who can tell everybody what your child is trying to say because you are familiar with that language. This is the sense that the Holy Spirit is taking and going, I see what your heart cry is. I know, I know you're expressing anger to God right now, but I know what's inside you right now. Let me take that before the throne, right? The Lord is our conduit through the Holy Spirit. The Lord is our connection to Father and Son. He's our translation. But he's also our conduit in the sense that he's getting us somewhere. The Holy Spirit is our seal of salvation. He is taking us into the eternal realm. If you've ever asked that unnerving question as to whether or not you're saved, there's an answer for you in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In him, you have also, after listening to the message of truth, or you also, after having listened to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were, past tense, sealed with him, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view toward the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Do you see the function of the Spirit here? If the Holy Spirit is in you, you can know that you are what? Saved. You know you have salvation. The Holy Spirit is the mark of the Father, God putting his stamp of approval on you, saying, this one is mine. This one belongs to me. So the Holy Spirit is our conduit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is our counselor. You know what a counselor is, right? An advisor, a supervisor, somebody who steps in to bring you good information and not bad information. A good counselor is the best kind of friend. Not every friend is a good counselor. Do you have people in your life who tell you you're being an idiot? Stop being an idiot. What you're saying, you are justifying in your own heart and mind, but that is not what is true. The best kind of counselor tells you things that are hard to hear. God has given us the very best kind of friend in the counselor who is the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit counseling us? Well, he is a teacher and a trainer. He gives us continual, ongoing, internal instruction. You ever seen the movie The Matrix? It's one of my favorite movies. I love that movie. There's a sequence in that movie where Keanu Reeves, Neo in the movie, is plugged into a device and they're downloading all sorts of information into him. And he comes up and he's like, whoa, I know Kung Fu, right? Uh, I don't know if he said whoa or not. I just, I feel like Keanu Reeves, every time he talks, says, whoa. Uh, But he says, I know Kung Fu, right? And, And watching that, you're like, oh, wouldn't that be amazing? How cool would it be to have this instruction that is eternal, internal, and like instant, and like just being pumped into your brain such that you could be like, wow, I've discovered something I could never have found out on my own. Amen and amen. (laughs) This is part of what the Holy Spirit is doing in us constantly. Good counselors don't just tell you what to do, but they train you how to think. And this is what the Holy Spirit is up to, and you and I today, in this moment, John 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. What does this mean? He will teach us all things. It means this. There is not one aspect of your life that cannot be better understood and better informed by the the instruction of the Holy Spirit. 
Whether that's doing laundry or being a better manager in your office place, whether that's shopping, whether that's speaking to your kids, whether that's addressing your spouse, whether that's relating to people who hate you, all of these things, anything you can think of, if you're an astrophysicist, all of these things can be informed and better understood by the presence of the Holy Spirit. But specifically, what kinds of things is he using in our training? Did you see? He will bring to remembrance all I have told you. Do you get that? Have you been engaged in something in life and all of a sudden the words of Jesus just pop into your head and you go, oh, can't do that now. I would feel terrible. Amen. The Holy Spirit is trying to teach you and train you. He's drawing to mind the things spoken by the Christ. The Holy Spirit is counselor. The Holy Spirit teaches and trains. The Holy Spirit guides and glorifies. Look at John 16, verse 12 through 15. If you had to go on a safari tomorrow in Africa, would it matter to you whether or not you were leading the safari or you had a guide? You would go out in the Serengeti just on foot. Would it matter to you whether or not you've got somebody to take you where you're going? It wouldn't matter a great deal to me. I ain't going on safari if I'm leading it, Right? But if you've got somebody who has navigated that area, who knows what they're about, then it's an exciting experience. There's a big difference between going through life with thinking that you are in charge of everything versus recognizing I have a guide in the Holy Spirit who is leading me, and I can trust where he's leading. John 16, 12 through 15. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. He will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. You catch what's happening here? The Holy Spirit is the one which is communicating the will of the Father and the, the force and teaching of the Son and instructing and leading you in all truth. He is a perpetual guide for us. How does this navigation glorify the Son and the Father? Well, have you encountered something in your life and gone, this is just like God said it would be? Oh, it turns out God actually knows what he's talking about. This is exactly what I've been reading in the scriptural text. Wow, they're responding to me just like he said they would respond to me. Wow, they've received this or they didn't receive this in such a way. It's like the Holy Spirit is directing us to go, see, I was right. See, what the Father said was right. See what the, what the, the Son said. These are true about your circumstance. He guides and glorifies. He also testifies. John chapter 15, verse 26. When the Helper comes... Uh, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he, you might want to underline he if you've got your Bibles open to that, he, which is a breach of the Greek language, right? Uh, They're calling him he to defer it from the neuter so that you recognize this is a personal agency. He will testify about me and... um, and will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Or you will testify also because you've been with me from the beginning. So he uses the masculine pronoun, even though the spirit is a neuter, this is a violation of grammar, again, to show that this is a personal agency. But what about the content of the verse? The content of the verse tells us that the Holy Spirit is there to bring you powerful divine discernment. Cut through lies. Exercise profound judgment and restraint, tempering your beliefs, exercising healthy criticism. If you've ever looked around at the world and gone, is everybody nuts? Like, how can you not see like the sewer of lies that everyone is drinking from? And the answer is they don't have the inner presence of the Holy Spirit abiding in them. If they did, it would be obvious and evident. But because you don't have that, discernment is distant from some people and they will continue to drink from the mouth of the sewer. The Holy Spirit is our conduit. The Holy Spirit is a counselor. The Holy Spirit is involved in conviction. Here's a weird question. Is it good to feel bad? Ah. Sometimes. Depends on what you feel bad about and depends on what you do with whatever guilt you have. There is a type of guilt that is just meant to drag you down and destroy you, and that's not from God. That's from the devil. There's a type of guilt that you receive and you go, I've got to be better. 
And that is from the Holy Spirit pushing you where you're supposed to go. It is conviction. But God does not just convict the church. God is actually engaged in convicting the world through the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 5 through 11. Check this out. But now I am going to him who sent me, and this is Jesus talking. Now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things uh, to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you can no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because of the ruler of this world has been judged. So the Holy Spirit is working on the world right now. The most rigid, avid atheist you've ever encountered, the Holy Spirit is poking them. The person who hates you as a Christ follower, the person who is indifferent to the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit is poking and gouging at them. This is what we call the external witness of the Holy Spirit. Everyone say external witness. Now, here's, here's what that means. Does the non-believer have the Holy Spirit abiding in them? No. But what we have in this text is God, Jesus says, look, the Holy Spirit is working on every person you have ever encountered. Now, what difference does that make? A really big one. It's the difference between people saying, crucify him, crucify him, and people going to Peter just a a few weeks later going, what must we do to be saved? Right? Because people are cut to the heart because the Holy Spirit is working beyond what we're doing. Now, here's here's where the rubber meets the road for us in these terms. A lot of times, we like to think of ourselves as doing the heavy lifting when it comes to salvation. You've been asked to move somebody before, right? Now, have you, ever, have you ever showed up to that move, and when you show up, like you realize everybody else got there like an hour or two before you, and the heavy lifting's all done? That's a pretty nice feeling. I mean, there's a little bit of guilt attached to it, but it's a, it's a pretty good feeling. When it comes to fighting for salvation and redemption in the, of this world, we, we can witness, we can counsel, we can instruct, we can befriend, we can bring healing and the like. But here's a very important truth revealed by this passage. You were never the first guy to the front. Before you ever show up, the Holy Spirit is working on people. He's, he's tilling the soil, he's pulling the weeds, and he's preparing them for you to say something or do something. Do you know what this world would look like if the Holy Spirit were not actively doing that right now? The break lines would be cut and we would be headed toward destruction. As bad as it is, it would be so much worse. You are never the first guy to the front. Anytime you approach a situation where you're going to talk to somebody about God, recognize who's been there before you. Have, have you ever been in a situation, maybe, maybe you had this experience, where you've you got a friend or somebody who you've been around for a while and um, you decide to broach the topic of the Lord, right? And you've never talked to him about Jesus before. And you start in. And as soon as you start in, you get this hostile reaction where they're like, would you stop badgering me? Who was talking to them before you showed up? Right? I can't tell you how many times that's happened where somebody's like, that's enough already. You're just the last most recent voice in the voice that has been speaking to them going, hey, buddy, you're going the wrong way. You're doing the wrong thing. Listen, there's something more to this life. You were made for a different reason than this. It's the external witness of the Holy Spirit convicting. There's also conviction that will happen in the end. Here's one of the cool things we can look forward to in space-time history. Um, There's a very strong indication in the Scriptures that the Jewish people will one day come to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah. The text seems to indicate that this will be, if not an overwhelming conversion, possibly even a national conversion of the Jewish people. Remember in Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus is, he's just chastised the leaders and officials in Jerusalem. And he's walking away and he begins lamenting. And you can just see him gesturing around to the city and the temple courts. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I've wanted to gather you together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were unwilling Behold, and you can see him gesturing at the temple when he says this. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. God's not going to meet you there anymore. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Now notice what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, I tell you, you'll never see me again. He said, you will never see me again until you recognize that I am Messiah. You want to see and perceive God again. That's when it is going to happen. What does this have to do with the Holy Spirit, you might be asking? Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. This is perhaps my favorite passage regarding the Trinity. I love this passage. Zechariah talks about a day when the Jews will return to God. Listen to this. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. So the spirit will be poured out, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Talk about a passage loaded with the Trinity. This is nuts. Did you see what happens here? The Father pours out His Spirit. This is a future tense. The Father pours out His Spirit, or will pour out His Spirit, and then He directs the, uh, the Spirit, gets into the Jewish people, and directs them to mourn over God, who identifies Himself as the one they, ha- they had pierced, But then he changes his pronoun usage. It was me whom they have pierced. And now is they will mourn over him as one mourns for an only son. The Trinity is entrenched in this passage. But what's cool about this, what's amazing about this, is that the work of salvation for the Jewish people seems to come at an instigation of a pouring out of this Holy Spirit over that people group. A spirit that drives them toward repentance and mourning, and salvation. Conviction does not end with the Jewish people. Uh, Conviction is taking place right now through sanctification. What kind of spirit are we talking about today? The Holy Spirit, right? What does holy mean? Set apart, right? Set apart, different than. One of the core functions of the Holy Spirit is to make you holy, right? It's to make you holy, In other words, it's to set us apart and make us different than the world. The process is known as sanctification. Turn your Bibles uh, to John chapter 14. It's to prepare us for sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, we read, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with His blood. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is there to help us obey Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's sanctification taking place. You beginning to obey Jesus. John chapter 14. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit as a companion. He was a conduit, a counselor. He's involved in conviction, and he is our companion, our helper, or our intercessor. The word that is often used to describe this in the scriptural text is paraclete. Everyone say paraclete. Paraclete. Sounds like what you put on before a soccer game. It is, it is not. Uh, a paraclete means one who comes alongside, a helper, a companion, a counselor, an advocate. And let's look at a use of paraclete in John 14, verses 16 and 17. I will ask the Father, this is Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Underline another. This is really cool. The term another that is used here, there are two Greek words that can be used for another to describe another thing. One is something different or separate than, and the other one is another of the same kind. Now listen to this. I will give you another of the same kind? I have been a paraclete to you, Jesus could say. I have been your helper. I've been a counselor and a comforter to you, but I'm sending you one like me. In other words, I'm sending you one like me and like the Father. I'm sending you the third member of the Trinity another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not know him or does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you. Abide means lives. He lives with you. And remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples before Acts chapter two. So he says, this is the spirit that abides with you now. The Holy Spirit's with you now and will, future tense, be in you. In other words, once Acts chapter 2 happens, the Holy Spirit is no longer somebody living with you. The Holy Spirit is now somebody living in you. 
companionship, true companionship. The Holy Spirit is our companionship. He is God inside us, God speaking to us and through us, connecting us to the Father and the Son. He is another of the same kind. So he is the way by which we commune with the Trinity. But more than that, it's not just fellowship with the Father, not just companionship with the Father that we get through the Spirit, but it's companionship with one another. Did you see the scripture passage we memorized this month? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the, the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. The fellowship, of the, that's not by accident. These are not just accidental words tossed in. We're like, what else do I have? Uh, fellowship. Well, that's the one we'll use. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Spirit helps us to fellowship with the Father and Son and be part with them, but the Spirit helps us to fellowship with one another. If the Spirit is in me, and the Spirit is in you, and the Spirit is in you, and the Spirit is in you, then we all have something really powerful in common. God with us, mingling through us, meeting with us. Philippians 2, 1 and 2, Paul says it this way, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. If the Spirit is in you, the fellowship of the Spirit should be in you. Hatred toward fellow believers and division among fellow believers should not be present. When, when it is, somebody is not listening to the Holy Spirit. In conclusion, as we wrap up today, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> All right. As we've been through this, this discussion on the Trinity, and I, some of this stuff's really difficult to talk about and navigate. And so there might be many people going, well, this is the fodder of theologians, right? Uh, this is more than academic, friends. Now, as far as I know, there is not going to be a test to get into heaven and receive salvation where you guys have to identify rightly every aspect of the Trinity. I hope that's not the case. We're, we'd all be in trouble. Uh, but with that said, the purpose of knowing God is not salvation. The purpose of knowing God is knowing God. We started this series by, by saying, hey, start praying this. Pray, God, I, I want to know you more. Lord, I want to know you more. I, I want to know you. I want to understand you. I want to spend time with you. I want this relationship. I want to know you more, Lord. And this is part of why the Trinity is important. It is us coming to understand who God is. We talked very briefly as we close out about uh, Acts chapter 2. Uh, something really amazing happens in Acts chapter 2. Um, you'll remember there's, there's cel- the, the apostles have gathered together. Then they, They're in the upper room. And do you remember what the day is that they gather? It's Pentecost. Pentecost. Do you know what Pentecost celebrates? It celebrates. It was a weird calendar feature that it's like it's just shoved in there. It's like this many days after this happens, you guys celebrate this. Celebrate what? This. This thing. Um, traditionally, it is held that the day of Pentecost represents the day that the fire of God descended on Mount Sinai. All right? And so this is the point in which the Jewish people began to meet with their God, and they recognized the holiness of this mountain. You don't go to it. You don't touch it. You got to stay away from it. It would kill you. And then what we see is the tabernacle gets set up. And how do you know God's there? Because the fire of God is over the tabernacle. For the Jewish person in this camp, if they wanted to know whether God exists, all they had to do was look out of their tent and be like, yeah. There it is, the fire over top of the tabernacle. And so what happens in the second chapter of Acts? The people are in the upper room, and a wind sweeps through the room. The Spirit's present, and a fire descends, and it separates out. And tongues of fire come to rest above each believer's head. Why? Because God's saying, you are now the place I meet with people. You are now my tabernacle. I dwell in you. What an amazing picture. Do you recognize the blessing we have in the Holy Spirit? But you might be asking yourself this question. Well, how do I know the Holy Spirit's in me? I don't have a tongue of fire. That would be awesome. Love to have that going on upstairs. That'd be really cool. Maybe a little hard to sleep. So how do I know the Spirit is at work in me? And I, I want to just leave you with this strong encouragement. We are told what it looks like for the Spirit to be in a person. Galatians 5, and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Are you those things? If the Spirit of God is in you, that should be a description of you. And not just that, but that in increasing measure. You might have a little bit of that now, but it should be more tomorrow and a great deal more next year and the year after. Is the Spirit of God in you? It should be evident by the fruit your life produces. Let's go to our Master in prayer. God and Father, we come to you by means of Jesus the Son, and we praise you for the paraclete, the helper that you've given to us. I pray that we would not take for granted what he has done and is doing and will continue to do. I thank you that he is a seal of our salvation. I thank you for his continual work working on the world and helping us to participate in your kingdom goals here in this life. Father, may we be a people full of your Holy Spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.